Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode five of the Butterfield Alpacas and Fiber Arts podcast. I'm Tasha Butterfield, alpaca rancher, crochet instructor, knitter, and fiber artist of pretty much anything alpaca. And as you could probably tell, in this podcast, I talk about alpacas and the fiber arts. For social media, you can find me on Instagram, Twitter, Ravelry, and Facebook. In fact, we have a Ravelry group just for this podcast. Over there, you'll find show notes, um, discussions about the episodes, and other topics that either myself or other members have started. So hop on over there and join us. In this episode, I'm going to cover quite a few things. First, I went to the Mid Plains Fiber Fest Fiber Fair this last weekend, so I'm going to talk about that quite a bit. What was there, what I brought home, um, who I took with, specifically some young people, and the impact it had on their lives. Then we're going to go out to the ranch and I'm going to show you what it's like when llamas and alpacas play with each other. It is a very cute um, and it's something that happened earlier this week when I did one of my live Facebook videos. So I'll show you that, and then I'm going to go into TB Strings and Things. I'm going to show you one of my new acquisitions, which I got at the fair, and that is a drop spindle. My very first time spinning, so I'm going to talk about that a little bit, as well as an antique spinning wheel that I have. Then I'll finish off with what is on my hooks and needles. In case you're curious about next week's episode, it's going to be very exciting because this week I'm going to the Shepherd's Mill, which is in Phillipsburg, Kansas. That is where I take my alpacas fiber to be made into yarn. So I'm going to give you a tour of their mill. Uh, They have large equipment that they use to do the whole process of making yarn. So I'm going to show you what that is like and a little history about the Shepherd's Mill. As in previous episodes, I have included down in the description box timestamps for all the topics and segments so that if there's something that you're not too interested in, you can skip right ahead to some other part of the episode. And down in the description box, you'll also find all the show notes. You don't have to leave YouTube to find links to things that I'm talking about. So you can look down there if you're curious about anything that I mention. You can also find the same show notes over on the Ravelry group. There was a new YouTube channel that I discovered this past week through one of my alpaca groups, and it's a young girl who has started her own channel about her animals. Her very first video was about her feeding her alpacas. She is super cute and super excited. She wants to share her animals with the world, and I encourage you to hop on over to her YouTube channel, which I've linked up here in the corner. Also, the link is going to be down in the, de- in the description box with the show notes. But go and watch her videos. Please like them and comment them. She is super excited to have her channel and would love engagement. I was the first one to comment on her first video, and her mom says she was super, super excited that someone actually have to comment. So uh, would you hop on over there and just check out her videos? Like I said, the first one was about her alpacas and their feeding time. The second video she just released, which is about her Angora rabbits. Both wonderful fiber animals, so please go on over and support her channel. Something I've been thinking about lately is doing a giveaway. I would like to increase the reach of this podcast, um, increase the subscribers and the number of views, So I want to encourage you to share this podcast. It could be anywhere, whether it's um, on any of your social media platforms, in any groups that you belong to. Just get the word out about this podcast. I would love to share alpacas with more people uh, and talk about, you know, the fiber arts world related to alpacas. So if you would help me get the word out, I would be so, so appreciative. And as a thank you, I'm going to do a giveaway of alpaca yarn. And I have chosen this type of yarn. I'm going to do two skeins, give away two skeins. And I have it in four colors. I only have three of them with me here. The brown, charcoal, and natural white. There's also a fawn color. You'll be able to choose two out of the four. They could be the same color. They could be two different colors. It's totally up to you. 
These are 70% alpaca and 30% merino wool, DK weight, uh, 100 grams, which is about 200 yards. And this is the same type of yarn that I used to make my striped fingerless mitts, which are now finished. I will show you those in TB Strings and Things later. Uh, but how you get entered into the giveaway is, first of all, please like this video, give it a thumbs up down below, and then down in the comment section, tell me where you have shared the channel, where you shared the podcast. And once we reach 300 subscribers total, like I said, we're about 250 right now. So once we reach 300, then I will do a drawing from all the people who have commented on this video as well as future episodes, as many episodes as it takes to get there. <laughs> Something else I've been thinking about is doing an alpaca cow. And would you be interested in doing an alpaca cow? I want to encourage more people to actually work with alpaca. And if you win the giveaway, obviously you'll have yarn to make something, so that would be great. And this can be knit or crochet. I think the only rule that I want to set is that the yarn used needs to be at least 70% alpaca. So it can be mixed with something else like wool or silk or that type of thing. Um, it could even be 100% alpaca. That's great too. So let me know your thoughts on that. Comment below. Um, I'll start a thread over in the Ravelry group as well so we can talk about it. And then in next week's episode, I will kind of give you um, a follow-up on what's going on with that. Now let's talk about the Mid Plains Fiber Fair. This is the very first time it happened. It was in York, Nebraska, which is pretty much in the center of the state, center kind of a bit east in Nebraska. And there was over 500 people who attended, which was really great for a very first fiber fair. It shows that there really was an interest in our area for such a fair. Unexpectedly, when I walked into the building, one of the very first people that I saw was Nikki of the Professor Knits. It's so funny when you run into people in real life who you've only known online or like seen videos of. And it was interesting because I saw her and I instantly felt like it was someone that I already knew. I just had this urge to hug her and she was someone I never met before in real life. We had just talked briefly um, through YouTube and we're excited that we were going to go to the same thing. So that was pretty fun and I saw her um, at least one other time later in the day when we took the picture. So um, that was really, really fun. I went with a friend of mine who is also a crocheter and two of my 4-H girls. In the last episode, I talked about 4-H. Well, two of my girls were able to come and interestingly, they were, they're the two best crocheters in the Fiber Arts Club that I started. And so it was an awesome, awesome experience for them. I'm going to talk about that uh, more specifically in just a little bit, but I want to show you first a video montage of uh, videos and still photos that I took throughout the event.
It was a really, really great event. I'm so excited that I went. I walked around the vendors a number of times. One of them was just to take this footage, but I kept going back to different vendors um, throughout the day as I learned things. I really appreciated the demonstrations that were there throughout the day. So let me read you what some of those were. And I saw most of these. Let's see, there was felted ornaments, which happened before I got there, so I didn't see that. Skirting your fleece, that was the first one I saw, and they actually took the, the fleece that had just been sheared from the sheep outside um, and demonstrated how to skirt it. If you're curious about skirting alpaca fleece, I have a video about that. I'll link it up above. Uh, they also had demonstrations on a weaver's rapid warp loom. The next steps in fiber prep, so how to wash your fleece. The joys of long draw spinning. So there was the antique like walking wheel, the big, big wheel, um, how to do that. And then also the traditional Norwegian slanty wheel uh, using the long draw spinning method. That was very interesting. And I'm going to talk about more about that later because that opened up a whole nother topic for me. And I'll get into that later. Um, indigo dyeing on wool. Continuous strand weaving. So learn how you can weave a whole piece of cloth without ever having to cut your yarn. Yes. And in the middle of, I guess, the main area where the vendors were and these demonstrations were happening, they had a fiber art circle. Pretty much chairs in a circle where you could just sit there and work on your projects. And I made sure that everyone, all my fiber arts girls, they brought something to do throughout the day. I spent a number of hours just sitting there working on my knitting project, which I'll show you later in the episode as well. Uh, but a lot of people were there with their spinning wheels and like all sorts of fiber arts were being done there. And it was really phenomenal. Um, when I bought my drop spindle, that's where I went and someone taught me how to use it. So fiber arts people are just so amazing. I feel like I keep saying that in every episode, but um, I keep having experiences where fiber arts people are just amazing. <laughs> My 4-H girls, I think, had the best time. I mean, yes, I had a phenomenal time, but they had the experience of a lifetime is really what it came down to. They had experiences this last weekend that they never would have had otherwise. So throughout the day, these girls got to learn um, how to weave both on a weaving loom and weaving with sticks. They got to see the sheep shearing, which neither of them had ever seen before. And at the end of the day, they got to needle felt, which was very exciting. They made things throughout the day. They were constantly doing something, constantly keeping themselves occupied with something. And it was very, very fun to see all the creativity and the excitement. It was the entire day. We didn't get home till late evening, but they wouldn't have traded it for anything. They loved, loved the experience. Okay, one thing I have not mentioned yet about the fair was the llama and alpaca show. And that's because I wanna talk about this a little bit more. Some of you may not have realized that llamas and alpacas actually show. The show that was put on at this fair was done by the Nebraska Llama Association. You may have remembered back, I think it was episode two, perhaps? Um, I went to the Nebraska Llama Association's annual conference, and I talked quite a bit about that. If you're curious about that, you can go back and, and watch that episode to hear all about what happened on that day. But at the Fiber Fair on Saturday, they put on this show, and it included showmanship class and an obstacle course class, as well as an opportunity for the public to take a llama or alpaca through the obstacle course themselves. Actually walk the llama or alpaca through the course, even if they had never handled one of those animals before. Now, neither of my 4-H girls were interested in doing that. They were too busy weaving <laughs> to uh, want to do that. But it's true that llamas and alpacas have shows, like national shows. It is a big thing if you are in either the llama or alpaca industries, shows are a big deal. And that drives a lot of the pricing for the animals, a lot of the breedings and that type of thing. The benefits of shows is that it creates a standard 
in which the industry is driven by. So all the breeding choice, I should say, a lot of the breeding choices um, are based on those standards in which they are the owners, the breeders, are looking for a certain result that will do well in the show ring, so they are breeding for that type of result. And I can't speak a lot towards the llama industry side of things. I'm still learning a lot about that. And the llamas I have are not intended for show. They're for guards. I'm not going to show them. I'm, I haven't trained them for obstacle courses or anything like that. Uh, so I don't know a lot about that industry, but I know a lot more about the alpaca industry. where The place where I bought my very first alpaca was a business model based on the shows. They went to shows all over the country. They did a lot of traveling, a lot of shows, they had a lot of ribbons. And the alpaca industry is, is a coin with two sides, pretty much. You have the shows on one side and the fiber industry on the other. And when I first got into alpacas five years ago, it was kind of like the the industry seemed to have an identity crisis because you had people on both sides. You had the breeders with the shows and you had growers with the fleece. It, you can kind of think of it that way. And they weren't quite seeing eye to eye that the industry started off with shows, you know, fashioned a lot after, you know, horse shows or dog shows or that type of thing in an effort to increase, improve the quality of the alpaca that was in North America. And there has been a lot of improvements. Even now, an alpaca that won first place 10 years ago might not even get in the ring today. You know, they're, they, the quality has improved so much over the years. Now, the alpaca industry is only about 30 years old, hasn't been around all that long, and it started off with the shows, like I said, in an effort to improve the quality and there was a co competitive nature about it to encourage people to do just that. Now, even though alpacas are fiber animals, uh, somewhere along the line, that was not really the focus. And this is just kind of hearsay because it was pretty much before my time in the industry. I don't really know. You know, I hear different types of stories. But when I got into the industry, it felt like there was an identity crisis because the, the show circuit had standards that did not match the textile industry demands of alpaca. You can have too fine of a fleece because what makes it too fine is it can gunk up mill equipment if it's too fine. The mill equipment just can't handle a certain type of fineness. And the show rings seem to have gotten kind of obsessed about finer, finer, denser, denser animals. I mean, density itself is not such a big deal, but fineness, there is a line in which it can be too fine. Sure, it's soft. Oh my goodness, it feels so wonderful. But the practical uses of it kind of had gotten lost. Or so it seemed. Right around five years ago when I got in the industry and I felt like there was identity crisis, there was also this effort to kind of bridge the gap and realign the industry into something more cohesive. Because just before that was um, a bit of an ec economic crash in the United States. Do you remember those years? Uh, you know, there was the housing crash and that created a, more problems in the economy. And that whole debacle of our economy did affect the alpaca industry. The alpaca prices fell quite a bit, and they have not recovered to that level since. Industry-wide, yes, there are prices that have gone up, um, but not the per as high a percentage of alpacas as there once was would be worth that much now. So that got people kind of reevaluating their alpaca businesses. 
if they were no longer able to make as much money through breeding and selling of animals, how were they going to make money? And there was this effort to re-examine how the alpaca was viewed within the industry and the fact that they are a fiber animal started to become more popular and more so in the forethought of how do we treat these animals um, as a business in which we get to make money. So with that, the show people, the fleece people started talking and becoming more cohesive. There have been a lot of changes in the industry. I came in to alpacas knowing exactly what I wanted to do, and that's the path that I've stuck with. I said, I'm a fiber artist. I know what to do with this stuff. I know the market for it. I know who's going to buy it. I know what they want, and this is what I'm going to do. So I did not come into the alpaca industry following the example of the majority of the industry. Uh, if I did, I probably would not be doing, be doing this podcast right now. I have my own ideas and my own thing and my own success. So I'm happy to see that the fiber animal of alpaca is more and more being treated like a fiber animal by its own industry in the United States. <laughs> That's pretty much all I'm going to say about that. Um, and I'm saying all this, why? I feel like I pretty much went on a big old tangent about the show, but maybe not. Okay. So I want to make sure that you know about the Alpaca Owners Association. That is our national association of which I am a member. There is a lot of information on there. If you're interested in attending an alpaca show, that is where you need to go to find one. If you want to see alpacas perform in the show ring, that's where you want to go. If you want to see a lot of them all at once and pretty much the best of the industry then you want to go to a show. It's it's a wonderful educational experience. There will be vendors there, just like at a fiber fair, but of course geared towards the alpaca industry. There's often educational seminars, um, demonstrations of various things. You can talk to a lot of alpaca owners about questions that you may have and to kind of get a sense of what alpacas are in your area. And if you are interested in raising alpacas yourself, whether for show or just for fiber like I do, um, it is, will be very helpful to know alpaca owners in your area. If you're curious about the llama side of things, check out the Alpaca Llama Show Association. That would be the shows for llamas. And I do not have experience going to these shows, although last year my state fair alpaca llama show became an official ALSA show. That is the only experience I have with ALSA. But if you're curious, more prone towards llamas, this is another association that you can check out and see what shows are happening in your area. This is a good time to take you on out to the ranch and I'm going to share a clip from a Facebook Live video that I took earlier this week that I guess it would be last week. <laughs> if you do not follow my Facebook page, you are missing out because that is where I do Facebook Live videos. So when that live video is going on, you can hop on there and ask me questions in real time which is very fun and you can see totally unedited unplanned things happening at the ranch and this last week i caught llamas and alpacas playing so let's go out to the ranch hey look at some see some play it's roman trying to play with bruno I don't think Bruno's very interested, but Roman's gonna try. Oh, I guess Bruno is interested. Let's see if I can zoom in. Llamas and alpacas play so similar. 
and they're so cute. Star, you're in the way. Some of the things that they do, you see they, they try to wrestle by um, connecting their necks. And then they also kind of nip at each other. They nip at the legs, they nip at the tail. And all this is just a very calm version of the way that they fight. If they were fighting, ooh, this would be much more dramatic. There'd be all kinds of screams and sounds. This is good play. Hey, Marco. The white and brown one, he is one and a half years old. And then the brown one, he's full grown. I don't even know his age. I bought him from someone who got him at an auction, so there is no paperwork. I have no idea how old he is. Roman's obviously the more feisty one. I'm actually very happy to see um, Bruno playing like this because I guess it would be a year ago he contracted meningeal worm which is a parasite that attacks the nervous system of llamas and alpacas. And if it's not caught right away, then they will die in a matter of days. Well, his got caught in time and it left him with weaknesses in his back legs. Now he contracted this when he was staying somewhere else and all my boys were brought to me in August of last year. So I put him in with the young boys who don't rough house and he'd be able to heal better. And he sure has. When he first got here last August, he would not have been able to run like this. He would get up and down very gingerly. But look at him now. Very, very good news. They could do this for a while. <laughs> you done? Should I really ask Roman? I'm pretty sure he instigated it.
they could go on for quite a while with this. You can already see Roman all worked up with his mouth hanging open. Yeah, but he's a young one. He still wants to play. Probably hot. It's like 80 degrees out here. They got all that fiber on them. Are you done, Roman? No. <laughs> All right, we got some more people on. Say hi. I don't even know who you are. They're slowing down. Yep, slowing down. <laughs> Bruno's asking, are you done yet? All right. While Roman's taking a body break, I'm going to switch to the other side of the fence here get closer to them. I hear the winds picking up. These are the two youngest I have in this section. They're four days apart and they're going to turn two years old in June. Bruno. I think he's saying he's fed up. He's an old man, he's tired. Yeah. Bruno's starting to see leave me alone. Got some of my other boys, the big boys, coming up. <laughs> Part of all the action. Oh! Now all these guys are riled up. I missed the chest pump. Hey, Claire! I come to this side of the fence and then there's activity on the fence side of the fence I was already on. Anyone else? lot more aggressive because they have their hormones. <laughs> the ones on this side don't yet, which is why they're all separated. Sorry, I was obviously wanting none of that. You guys are seeing a lot of activity. Riley's interested. If 
Riley was interested in playing, then he'd be wrestling back, not just running away. They, they rile each other up. Vinny's all worked up. He has his mouth hanging open. He's probably so hot. His nostrils are flared. You guys done? Cowboy again. Oh, who's Vinny going after? Now with the grown boys, they can start off playing like this, and then it can really escalate into a fight. Wow, those guys are going quite a ways away. And all these guys are going, what is happening? I mean, everyone's watching. Riley again. This is a very long video, huh? <laughs> I keep thinking, okay, what else is gonna happen? sounds yeah that's fighting sounds see it's already escalated or you got someone who doesn't want to play letting someone else know they don't want to play super super cute oh my gosh I love to watch them play and I'm trying to remember to take my camera out with me more often uh, it's hard to catch a lot of the fun like spontaneous things that happen because I just can't get the camera out in time to get some of it but I'm gonna try more and more to get that because it's just so so cute okay let's move on to TV strings and things and I'm gonna show you one of my acquisitions from the Fiber Fair, and this is a drop spindle, my very first one. I knew going to the fair that I wanted to get, sorry, I wanted to get a drop spindle. Um, after I interviewed my friend who's a spinner to do that video about spinning a pack of fiber, and I'll link that up here in the corner and also down below. Um, it was a phenomenal interview. Oh my gosh, I thought it went so well, and there was so much information in there. If you have any inkling of an interest in spinning, then go watch that video. Um, I had not spun. Okay, that's not completely true. At a fair like four years ago or so, um, someone had let me sit down at their spinning wheel and give it a shot and it went really well. Uh, they said I was a natural um, and that's great. <laughs> But I kind of stuck with the crochet knitting that I knew and I was like, okay, well spinning maybe someday I, You know, I wasn't too interested in adding another 
craft to what I do because I feel like I do so much already. Um, but after that interview about spinning a pack, I was like, hmm, maybe I do. Maybe it would just be fun to know how. It doesn't have to be like the primary thing I do, but it would be good to learn. I think it would be good just to know it and understand how it all works. And I had decided that it was time to get a drop spindle after the interview. So I went there intending to buy one and I got one that came with um, wool, I think four ounces of wool. So that is what I have been practicing with. And let me show you a bit of, of what I know. It's only been a couple of days, so let me show you. Now I already kind of spun some of this and I'm near the end here. Twist, twist, draft. It's starting to spin back. I'm so close to the camera. Okay, I need to add some more on, so I'm going to add this on here. Look at all that I've done so far. I think I've done nearly half of the wool that I was given. And I do want to weigh what remains. Actually, let me show you my roving. This is what's left. Okay, so I don't think I have half of it left. I've gotta have more than half, but I do want to go weigh this so I know approximately when I've reached half because then I will uh, wind up what is on here and make it its own ball and then do the other half as a second ball and then I will ply them together. So I will have a two ply yarn. I've been watching a number of spinning videos and I'm going to create a playlist of those because they've been on YouTube and I'm going to include in there the ones that have been the most helpful to me. And sometimes I get very thin. Oh, I'm about to lose. Had some spin in there. Now I've heard, you know, so many people talk about when you very first begin to drop spin, I guess maybe even spin on a wheel, um, if you skip the spin, drop spindle, that, you know, you get this thin, thick yarn just because you're learning. And you can see here a thicker part and a thinner part. I totally have the thick, thin thing going on. This needs more twist in here. So we'll keep twisting. It's mesmerizing. I'll say what I have the most trouble with is joining more fiber. Like I'm trying to join it now and I just have the hardest time I figure so much of this is just going to come with practice, but see, this was my join. See that? Don't really know how to fix that. I guess I figure I do plan on knitting this up into something. Knitting over crochet simply because knitting will take less yarn <laughs> and I can make something that's bigger. Um, but I figure I'll just incorporate that little bit into whatever uh, whatever I'm knitting so I'll just cover it up that way I will say it is something that's very gratifying and I probably came into this kind of backwards than most people 
because I have a lot of the fiber processing equipment, which I showed you two weeks ago with the dryer balls. I know how to wash fleece. First of all, I have goo gobs of alpaca fleece. I know how to wash it, pick it, cart it. I've taken classes on using a drum carter because I did that because of things that I want to make in my studio with the alpaca fiber. So I had all this knowledge about processing fiber before I knew how to spin it. So I feel like I've kind of gone into this like the backwards way. Uh, but having worked with fiber so much, having processed it so much specifically for the dryer balls, that it's quite fascinating to do the whole drafting part going, I'm familiar with working with fiber and pulling it apart. And I mean, with picking and carding, so much of this is familiar having worked with the fiber. But as I look at this and I watch, you know, how I'm drafting, I just, it's so reminiscent of that part. Okay. I know it's way out of frame. But if I drop it too much, it'll hit my lap and then it won't spill, spin. So it'd be quite addicting. I was doing this last night while I was watching TV because a lot of people say they do that, you know, this and Netflix, just like you would knit or crochet with Netflix. So drafting. So I think for only doing this for two days, I'm doing pretty good. I've had my share of frustration for sure. I've had this drop on me so many times. Like I said, my biggest frustration is adding more fiber on, but I'm getting better. And I just have to be patient with myself. So this is now part of what I'll do during my free time. <laughs> We'll see how far I get for, till next week. Now I want to tell you about something that happened at the fair and that was when one of the demonstrators was showing how to do the long draw on a Norwegian, what you call it, traditional Norwegian slanty wheel. And um, I saw her bring this out and it looked awful, awful familiar to me. And I watch her demonstrate on it and I'm looking at all the parts of it and I'm like, I have this wheel. This wheel right here. This wheel right here. Yes. So what happened was that a few years back, some friends of mine saw this spinning wheel at a garage sale. It was for like 20 bucks or something. So they asked me if I wanted it, they bought it, uh, they picked it up for me and brought it. And it was like on all these pieces and I'd figure out like what to do. And I didn't spin. I didn't know what all the parts of a spinning wheel were. I wasn't sure if everything was here, if it worked or what. Uh, so it's pretty much been um, a catch-all, like a ornament piece, um, a hat, tree. I have used this at my alpaca open houses to show the different parts of alpaca processing, the fiber processing. Um, so I had this there when I was unable to have an actual spinner. I have had spinners there sometimes. One time I wasn't able to, so I brought this wheel. Just had it sitting there going, okay, this is, you know, one of the steps. Um, but there was always this question of, is it a real wheel? And I don't know if how many of you are familiar with this phenomenon in the 50s and 60s, that there were manufacturers who made wheels simply as decorative items. They were not functional. They didn't actually make any yarn. You couldn't spin on them. But they made them so realistic that you could mistake them to be a functional wheel. 
And I, I learned it this soon after getting this wheel as I was looking into, okay, what kind is this? How do you use it? And there were a number of questions that popped up for me and I didn't really get answers for them. So it's just kind of sat in my guest room. Like I said, it's become a hat tree trying, you know, just waiting until I found someone who could answer my questions. Well, I went up to the demonstrator of that Norwegian slanty wheel and I asked her, um, I said, okay, I have a wheel that looks almost exactly like this. And I, I described everything and I was like, the only thing I can't find on this is the orifice. It's like everything else seems to be there. Um, so her and her husband were there in the booth and they kind of asked me a few questions. Um, again, you know, they're familiar with this phenomenon of the man people who manufactured these wheels for decorative items, but didn't really um, make them functional. So I still came home with this question of, well, is this a real wheel or not? I found a number of great videos. I've included those in that spinning playlist, but one in particular by Abby Frankamont. She has a number of awesome, awesome videos. She's someone who actually teaches spinning. So she has a number of great videos with a lot of great information. And one of them was, should, she called it, should you buy that old spinning wheel? And she was going through all the different things that you check on a spinning wheel to make sure that you have all the parts. Is this gonna work? What do you need to replace? And one of the questions that she addressed was, how do you know if it's a fake? Okay. So let me show you my wheel and what I discovered. Forgive all my cords and this like behind the scenes ugliness down here, but you know, it's real life. Everyone has cords. Okay, so this is what I've discovered and, and I, I went through Abby's checklist trying to figure out if this is a real wheel or not. Now, the first thing is this wheel really does spin and there is the piece of wood that goes from the wheel down to the treadle it's a single treadle and it does spin wonderfully it came with this piece of leather that was wrapped around the wheel um, I don't know if that was original to it or someone just put it on there um, it really does no good for using as an actual wheel so I've just kind of left it off the back there but yeah it's fun just to treadle it oh my goodness look I'm spinning okay not really well, so besides the drive band not being real, uh, the next thing that she questioned, said you needed to check, was if the flyer and the bobbin would spin independently. And I did take this off to check. I took off the whirl. I'm learning all this terminology. I took off the whirl and the bobbin did come out and the whirl and the bobbin were pretty stiff, but just taking it apart, you know, you can see the bobbin moves. And as I place it on here, um, the, I know that the flyer and the bobbin do spin independently. And if I had the drive band on here properly onto the wheel, they would spin independently. I haven't tried that, but I'm confident that it would. It has all of the, I don't know what these are called, but these pins along here, they're all there, right? Has these great leather parts here on both the front and the back. Both of those are there. The mother of all that is all there. There's even this distaff here, you know, that comes off. You put all your raw fiber here so it's easily accessible it was used more for flax as far as i understand um it's not really super necessary or necessary at all if you're uh spinning from roving but you know it's a nice look so that's there the tension knob moves and this can actually move back and forth so you can adjust the tension of your, uh, what's this called again? Drive band. So that moves. I went through Abby's checklist 
Every single thing is here except for one. There's no orifice. There's this hole here as in a real spinning wheel, but there is no hole at the end here where the yarn, the fiber would actually go in there. And this is the part that would do the twisting, actually create the twist on the roving and would load it then onto the bobbin. That's not there, which means I have a very realistic fake spinning wheel. It has every single thing I would need to spin, except a hole right there. I did think, okay, well, what if, can you like drill a hole in there and create an orifice? Maybe, maybe. This is wood and orifices that I've seen tend to be some type of metal, steel or something, I'm not quite sure, but some type of metal. And I imagine, you know, over time, you know, that metal is the better way to go. Um, and that wood would wear out eventually, you know, all the friction and that type of thing that happens right here. I don't know. But what was recommended to me at the fair is that I look into some spinning wheels out of Lithuania. Um, some antique wheels are being sold for parts and I should look for this part that is the same size as this fake <laughs> uh, flyer bobbin whirl piece and just get one that would fit here. And then since everything else is in working order, I could use it as a spinning wheel. So I did look on eBay. I didn't find exactly the size that I needed, but it gave me some really good ideas of what I should be looking for. And so my next question um, it's going to be exactly how do I measure this? Because I did have a question of, of this part here. And I'm going to have to do some more research about that. Some more asking. See if I can take this wheel to someone who can just tell me uh, how to measure this. Because it's like I could do the measurements between these two leather tab pieces. Because um, I think the orifice, like the whole... This, what is it? this hole and the orifice hole should be on the outside of this leather piece. Whereas here, you know, that hole is on the inside of the leather piece, the fake version, but the real thing should be sticking out this way, right? That's my question. I don't know, but that is going to change the measurement of what it is I need to be looking for from here to here, right? Anyway. Do you have a fake spinning wheel? On to things that I know a lot more about, and that is knitting and crochet. I have finished my striped fingerless mitts. These are the mitts that were supposed to be uh, tapestry crochet. And I told you last week that I gave up on the tapestry part because of some something in the tapestry pattern that I didn't understand it and I couldn't figure it out, just was not coming out right. So I did this, the stripes, the part where uh, it was supposed to be tapestry, did stripes instead. And overall, I like how they came out. These are going to be nice and warm. This is gonna be great for, you know, typing at my computer in the winter when my house is cold and I don't wanna pay goo gobs of money to heat it it beyond what it is. Um, but these are very warm. They're very comfortable. I really like it. Uh, the structure in general, I really liked. I think I might use the structure for future mitts that I uh, plan on designing. The only thing I don't like is that because I chose to do the stripes, you can, wait, you can see that one. There we go. You can really see the joins. I think it's just the nature of stripes. I tried a number of different methods to um, 
to kind of minimize that. And interestingly enough, the stripes came out in slightly different places, didn't they? Yeah, slightly different places. Well, in the tapestry crochet design, where the joins are was all one color, so that would not have shown. The only reason it's showing is because I chose to do stripes. And if I were to do this again, I would design it so that the joins were here instead. So they're facing in rather than facing out, which is going to be the view of other people. I'd rather be facing me than facing other people. So the reason that they did not design this <laughs> with stripes, <laughs> ah, it doesn't matter. I like them anyway. The project I told you about last week that I'm doing as a baby gift was the baby cocoon. And I got the yarn for, I'm trying to get all that, got the yarn for it and I started it. So let me show you what I've done so far. If you follow me on Instagram, you would have seen the beginnings of this. I saw you. Yes. This is only my second project with cables. There we go. And I think they're coming out very cute. I really like it. It's a very cute design. In working with this project, I realized that it could very simply be done on a knitting machine in the fraction, in a fraction of the time. So this week I plan on putting this on my knitting machine and completing it the rest of the way up. The, the back part, so this is just the front of the cocoon, the cocoon. The back portion, there's still the cables on the sides, but all through the center in between here, that is all three by three rib. And I have not decided yet if I will do that on the machine or not. I only have a medium gauge flatbed machine, which will be great for this. I'm not so sure it'll be great for the rib. Like it can be done and will come out great in the end, but in terms of saving time, I'm not so sure. And it's because the flatbed machines, they make stockinette. Everything is just the knit stitch. And it's what's facing you is the back of the work. So the purl side is facing you. And you can do the rib, but that means that you need to change knits to purls on the machine. And that is done manually. Uh, with a tool and I will do that for the cables I am gonna have to um, switch I'll do like one row of all knit then I'm gonna have to switch out right in here when it to do the cable I have to swap stitches which is no big deal that happens fast but I am gonna have to do the wait the pearls I'm gonna have to switch out the knits and make these pearls and I thought well for this it's still gonna be a time saver because it's only two stitches on either side of the cable and it can happen fairly quickly but the three by three rib that's a lot more knit stitches that I have to change to pearls and in the end it may not be a time saver so I might do the back of the cocoon still all hand knit so this is just going to be a combination of hand knit and machine knit. This week when I put this on the knitting machine and show you how I adjust this, I'll kind of go into machine knitting a bit more. Um, if you've never experienced it, I'll kind of give you a brief rundown about what it is. And I'm totally happy with my mid-gauge machine. Now I'll get more into that about the different types of machines and all that's available out there. And I got one that's more on the more inexpensive end and it's perfect for what I want to do. Yeah, all these details start running in my mind. I want to start talking about machine knitting, but no, 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 no. I'm going to say that for next week's episode. Ah, so next week, yes, I will talk about machine knitting and also 
the mill, the shepherd's mill, the tour with that. So those are two things that you will certainly be looking forward to next week. And that is pretty much all I have for TB Strings and Things. Don't forget to enter the giveaway, which requires you to give a thumbs up to this video, share it with whoever you think it would be interested, you know, through your social media networks. Um, it, that means Facebook groups, Ravelry groups, Twitter, you know, wherever you are allowed to share, please share, and then comment down below where it is that you have shared. And once we reach 300 subscribers, I will do a drawing from all the names who have given a comment about where they have shared. Thank you so much for joining me today. Uh, I so appreciate you being here with me and um, watching all the way to the end of my episode. Have a great week, and I will see you next week for episode six.